that do not know the Lord. I'm going to ask you, just begin to speak out their name right now.
Father, we pray for our own children, the ones dearest to our hearts. To the ones that have never surrendered. For the ones who have surrendered but have walked away. the ones who have surrendered stay close to you grant them their destiny in you Father grant each one that destiny in you oh come mothers come fathers 
pray for your children now. Intercede for them. The gates of hell will not prevail. Not against our God. Not against His purposes. The victory is His. The battle's been won. Oh, step into that place of victory.
place where we step into the center of your will and your heart in terms of the world, in terms of the lost, in terms of our families, in terms of our children. For we will yet give you our praise. Oh, give him a shout of joy!
Right now, as through a glass darkly, but then, face to face, no veil, eye to eye, heart to heart. And on that day, oh God, there's no more need for intercession. On that day, with you forever, hasten the day, Lord. Hasten the day. Stretch your arms out to the person on your right. Until that day, Father, raise up an intercessor. Pray it in. Stretch out your hand to the person on the left. Raise up an intercessor, oh God. Whoa. I don't think we're done yet, so we're going to do another one. <laughs> Hold me in your arms, never let me go. I want to spend eternity with you.
Good evening, everybody. Say hello to somebody and uh, tell them this very good news. Tell them you're going to get a prophetic word tonight. Okay, you just like to take your seat. It's actually true. Everybody in the place is going to get a prophetic word tonight. And Dan's going to prophesy over everybody. <laughs> Joy, where are you? Joy, do you want to come and soak, Sharon, Nancy? Well, what a fantastic day. I'm overwhelmed with revelation. I know, was it, was it Steve, did you say that somebody said up from the platform that we were going to be getting revelation during the day just by spending time with the Lord just ourselves. Who here has had significant revelation from the Lord, a download? Give me a wave to see what God's been up to here. Oh, he has been busy. This is fabulous. That's excellent. You know, he's going to do a couple of things tonight. I just want to have Sue Strachan up here and Glenn Bailey. Glenny e. Bailey and Susan Strachan. Are you here? Susan Strachan or Glenny e. Bailey? Excellent. Oh, hello. Come over here. This is Glen I. I got it all wrong, I'm, for, I'm afraid. But this is Glen I Bailey. And uh, I just want to let him express to you what God's been doing. And it's great to see that he works in all ages and all sizes. Glen, what's God been up to? Um, just last night when Pastor Arnott told us to pray for dental miracles in our teeth, I had like six or seven, like, fillings in my mouth and three cavities that needed to be filled and the Lord filled them and had those silver cavities turn into porcelain. Yeah. Why don't you guys not give me a look? 
Okay, so we've got some very nice white porcelain teeth here. And everything looks very good. So thank you, Father. What do you think? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> you know, there's... God filling them as opposed to sitting in the dentist chair is a very good thing, isn't it? Down the bottom. This is a witness. This is a witness. The other thing we can do is get the camera, but it's it might be a little bit difficult to have a look in the camera, but there's a witness. It's, it's definitely something good going on in here. Father, I ask that you would just come and fill him now. Glenn, I, you have a destiny. You have a destiny. Father, I ask that you would stir up within him the gifts, the abilities that you have planted before time. And Lord, that you would train these hands for war. And Father, I ask that you would pour out your presence and, and dreams and visions in the night that you would have, that he would have visitations. Visitations that would show him things of the kingdom in Jesus' name. Holy Spirit, we ask you would just come and fill. Oh, wow. Sue, what's been up with you? Come over here so the light's better. This is kind of a hot spot right here. Well, last night when uh, John Arnott said to pray for um, dental uh, miracles, um, I just put my hands up and uh, when I touched my face, I just went shooting over the chairs <laughs> with the anointing. Is your back okay? Well, somebody sat in my head, so I don't know if that's bad. <laughs> and I've got a gold tooth. Well, I didn't know I had a gold tooth until I came up for prayer um, to the soaking school, and Connie Sinnott said to me, you've got a gold tooth, do you know that? And I said, oh, I didn't know. Show me. <gasps> oh, my goodness. Okay, Dan, come on up. <laughs> at the back, at the top. Oh, my. Woo! Okay. Okay, we're going to get a photo of this one. This may go on the website. Can you get a photo? Can you get a photo? It's a little bit undignified, but... Okay. When I was here at the Bride of Christ conference last year and people were getting gold teeth, I said, God, I'd love a gold tooth. But don't put it at the back, put it at the front. Because <laughs> I don't want any of you looking down my mouth. <laughs> so there's a little bit of dignity left there. Yeah. <laughs> God's got to say Father, I ask you would still sue with your power and your love. Father, let her heart know of your goodness in Jesus' name. You know, there's been a number of people coming to me and telling me that they have friends and family that couldn't make it to the conference that are ill, sick and injured just recently. Now I can also testify, my mother unfortunately on Sunday fell over at church and broke her ankle. And she's in New Zealand. So I have a real heart for all the ones that couldn't make it to the conference that need healing. And we always like to pray uh, for healing and allow the Holy Spirit to move and and, uh, see what he wants to do. But I would like to invite everybody that would like to stand in the gap for somebody's healing that is a dear loved one to stand right now. We're going to ask the power of God to uh, go over the internet. Um, I don't cameras, I don't know what you can do here. Maybe you can focus in, instead of focusing on me, uh, focus in on the people over here, uh, wherever you can. And we're just going to lift up a cry and ask the Lord to heal over those internet waves, over the distance of the miles in the Spirit. We're going to ask and command the Holy Spirit to go into those bones, into those bodies, and anywhere that needs healing. Is that okay? Okay. Father, I thank you for your healing anointing. Father, I thank you that you sent Jesus on the cross to die for these very people's injuries and sicknesses. And Lord, I ask now that you would send your healing anointing to every single person represented here, that you would send your, um, your Holy Spirit to brood over their bodies and ho- seek out everything that's wrong that is not of you. And Father, I ask that you would penetrate their bodies, their cells, their bones, their tendons, their muscles, and you would do creative miracles in Jesus' name, and that you would 
that you would bind up the, even the broken hearted and that you would um, yeah, set the captives free from their captivity of injury in Jesus name and because I have the microphone I especially bless my mother's foot to be well now in Jesus name Lord, I ask that you would go right into that hospital room and that you would heal that broken ankle by the power and the love of your anointing in Jesus' name. Wow. Amen. Amen. Right. I just want to ask if there's anybody else that has had an amazing time today or this week that would like to share. Anybody that's had an incredible... Yeah, come here. What has God been up to? It's always good to know what God's been up to in others, so it increases our faith. Hi. Um, God's been doing a lot in terms of releasing um, words me and about what's coming next in the open door and going from a time of sorrow to a time of joy and all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> and this Wednesday, I went down to the Brazilian consulate to get my visa to go um, in two weeks with Randy Clark to Brazil. And they said, no, you can't have it. You're doing religious work. Sorry. And I was just so tired. I got here. I called my mom. And she's like, well, don't give up. I'm like, mom, I'm tired. You can pursue it. You can call the organization and deal with it. And so she got a hold of them, got a letter mailed here. I took it down today and I missed the service, but went down and he was like, no, you need a different visa. I'm like, well, can you just read this letter? And he said, well, I'll talk to the consular. And he went back and he's like, okay, you can have the visa. You can go. So. Father, hey, 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 you're not getting away with that. Father, may the Holy Spirit come and fill it. And Father, we bless her. Uh, for this Brazilian trip. Father, I ask that you would download right now everything she needs for that trip, Father. You would just supernaturally give her uh, gifts of faith, healing, hope. Father, I pray that these hands would be a place of um, transference of your power and your love and healing in Jesus' name. Who? Okay, lady in the glasses. Have you got a testimony? Yeah. Were you praying? Yeah. Do you want to share something? Anything that God's doing this week? All right, come on. This is called being stretched. But she's got this shine on her face, and I think it's more than a tan. So, what's your name? Suzanne. Suzanne. I'm Lindley. Nice to you. Having a good time at the conference? Yes, so much. Um. I just feel a lot more free because I can I can just feel Jesus' love in my heart and I can look at him and it's like he's between me and everyone else so I can just, because of his love in my heart, because I can look at him and he's between me and everyone else, I can just do what he says, you know? And it just feels so wonderful and I can literally feel that and then I just... People are just more lovable. I just want to kiss people. <laughs> I'm kissing these ladies here. <laughs> that is fantastic. That is fantastic because if we don't have love from the Father. Pour it in, 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 pour it in. I'm convinced that when the scripture says we're to love one another, that God didn't design it to be all in our own effort. That actually he supplies us with the love that we can pour out and pour out and pour out to others. So I know that I can't love everybody in my own strength, so we need to rely on on his love, don't we, John? John, what's happening in your heart? <laughs> I'm, I'm loving this. I think it's great. Ten years on and... The Holy Spirit is still here in power. Hey!
Okay. Speak to the foot. Has God, has God given you any fresh revelation today? their head in the guillotine yet. Revelations? <sighs> Have you told them that? <sighs> you know about um three three years ago. right now. Right here is a good spot to be. (laughs) Take it! Take it! Don't look at it! Take it! This is here! The fire is here! 
10 years and he's still here. Just take it. Right where you are. Don't wait for the prayer line. Take it right where you are. Catch the fire. Catch the fire. Give me a go. Catch the fire. Catch it. Take it. Take it. Take it. Now that you're heading the guillotine. Hi. You know, I'm going to tell you this little story. One time, a number of years ago, John told me about how he was in uh, an airport. Ha! Hi. Hi. God. Write for God. He's got books in you. Write for God. Kathleen. Many books for Jesus. River books. Write for God. Karaba. An author for God. Shariba. Ay. Babushka. A babushka just fell. Ay, 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 ay. ago when I was in Ukraine 
Where are the Ukrainians here? Where's Oksana? And I, um, all of a sudden when I was preaching, this word came out of my mouth. Arriba! And I had no idea what it meant. And I didn't really think about it that much. Arriba. And I was saying this about two years I was preaching, and we, sometimes in our meetings things like this happen. And Melanie Morgan Donor from the Big God Ministries was with us in Yalta. And I was saying this word that was come that Lord the Lord was releasing this word, Arriba. And she started laughing. Melanie started laughing, and at the end of the meeting came up to me and said, Do you know what you're saying? I said, I have no idea. Now, I'm not a Spanish expert. It means, I mean, it, just, it means higher in Spanish. And then we started investigating, you know, what's the Holy Spirit saying through this? And, and then we asked someone else, and they said, well, that means quicker. And then John just recently, what, what did this person say that you were talking to? It means wake up, wake up, wake up. So for what it's worth, God is saying to the church, Arriba! 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 Wake up! We're going somewhere! Get there! Get there! Get there! Quicker! Higher! Wake up! Quicker! Higher! We're going somewhere! The Holy Spirit is calling us higher! He's calling us quicker! It's not my word! It's not a goofy thing! It's not a silly thing! It's the word of the Lord! So, if you're willing to become a sign and a wonder, listen, just let, just let him take us there, quicker and higher. Oh, bless you, Dad. Shoot. You know, he's he's living in a nation that is on fire for God right now. I'm telling you. Carol, uh, we were just there. Alan was with me and some others. And what a time we had in uh, Russia and the Ukraine because it's just breaking out everywhere. And there have no distractions, really. Nothing worth living for except the kingdom of God. What a wonderful, wonderful thing it is. So, Dan, keep on yelling. Wake up, wake up, won't you? <clears throat> I love how he walks through the water when he gets going. You know, his feet coming right up. 
There's a river up here, folks. <sighs> Lean over to someone near you and say, God, give them more of your presence right now. Give them more. I think we took time to find out where everyone was from here. <laughs> you don't even care, do you? You know. People are from all over the world. <laughs> Woo. You know, Dan had mentioned, put your head in the guillotine. And some of you went, huh? But he was referring to what he said the other night, where he just leaned over and put his head in that little round part on the chair in front of him. And the Lord said, good, you know, we want to want to cut off all of that. It's not that the mind and thinking and everything is bad, but it's been so overdone, hasn't it, that the people of just this rationalness has, has squeezed the very life out of the out of a lot of what the church is for. So there's a lady right up here. She, she was the only one I know that did it. She put her head in it. <clears throat> and Clark near and sitting near her went, Bing, you know, cut it off. And the Holy Spirit just fell on her. And was it you, Chris, that did that? Anyway, it'll take too long to explain. But I don't think you got it. <laughs> Oh, she got a healing as well. Come on up here and tell the story then. <clears throat> You're going to want to put your, your neck on the line here in a minute when you hear this. What happened, Doris? Well, I, um, I, I just put my head in there on the, on the thing because you said somebody put their head in that, in that thing, and so I did, and that lady there, she, saw my head in there, and she just went, like that, and all of a sudden, the power got hit me, and, uh, oh, I don't know what happened, really, but I know I had a headache, uh, when I went down, when I got back up, it's gone, and my head is, like, clearer, and I don't know, I just feel really good. <laughs> Great, isn't it? Okay, now, we've done all kinds of stuff like that around here, but... I don't think the guillotine is one we've ever done before. You know, we've, we've put <clears throat> fire tunnels, put your head in the wine barrel, you know, have another drink and all this kind of stuff. Maybe you, maybe you should do that. Have one last drink. You know, you get your cup, right? Fill it up. Now say cheers to the person next to you. And down the hatch, all right? Down the hatch. Ooh. All right. Now put your head in the guillotine. <clears throat> and somebody near you go, boom, you know. Every opposing thought that is keeping you from all God has for you, it goes right now in the name of Jesus. All the left brainers are getting it tonight. <laughs> Woo! Hmm. You know, it is so wonderfully childish and childlike. 
to just be with the Holy Spirit because, Dan, I think it was more prophetic than you realized. All we can say, Holy Spirit, is that we love your presence. Thank you for touching Doris. Fire on you, Doris. More and more and more and more and more. <clears throat> you know what? If you've got pain in your body tonight, if you've got illnesses or sicknesses or everything else, and you're worried about it, and probably you are, is that anybody here? Still got pain problems, worries? But... Okay, put your head in the guillotine then. We're going to die to all that worry and all that pain and all that problem. Just, just lay your neck right in that round part right there. And someone near you go, that's it. We cut that all off of you in Jesus' name. Out it comes, Father. Out it goes. Oh, Jesus, you are amazing. We love your kingdom, Father. We do. Help us to be ch children in the Father's presence. Woo. Help us, Lord, to be children in the Father's presence. Let it roll all the way to the back, Father. All the way to the back. That's right. Pass it back. Pass it back. Pass it back. Pass it back. Waves of the river of God. More, Lord. Give it, right? All the way to those guys at the back. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. It's hard to say that we got people here from various nations. How many Americans are here? Stand up and give us a shout. Bless America, Father. Keep her strong and keep her close to you, closer and closer. How many Canadians have we got? We have some. Woo! You know, I'm just believing God for a political change in this country. And we got an election coming up in a couple of weeks. Come on, stand up and declare it. Father, change in Canada in Jesus' wonderful name. We take it, Lord. We take a hold of it. It is ours by the anointing. We want godliness back in this nation. We want Christian leaders and men and women of principle. And we take it. We call it in right now in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus. We are having it. And the enemy is not going to rob our freedom and our wonderful nation from us. Woo! How many here from the United Kingdom? <clears throat> Stand up, all you Brits. Come on. Stand up and give us a mighty shout. <clears throat> Shiva. You know, Sharon mentioned it, but she is going for the third time to pray and prophesy over leaders in the British Houses of Parliament next week, I think it is. Give the Lord praise for that. If you are from Europe somewhere, stand up. Europeans somewhere. Not the UK now, but the rest of Europe. All right, just stay standing. If you're from Holland, give me a wave from the, from the Netherlands. If you're from Germany, give us a wave from Germany. 
From Switzerland, give us a wave. From, is there anyone here from France? Yeah, from, uh, from North Ireland. You're all from Ireland. Glory to God. You know what, we, uh, I think it was the youth conference, we had a whole group of young people from Ireland, and I made the mistake of calling them up Sunday morning to pray for them, you know, we almost had a riot in the place, it was, but I think, all you Irish, come on up here, and just get a double portion, take it home for the glory of God. If you're from Ireland somewhere, north or south, I don't care, come on up here. Let me have ministry team come and pray for them. Oh, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Stand on that nice green line. Spread out a bit. Stand on the line so we can pray for you. Well, we got more Irish than we thought here. Spread out a bit. Stand. Put your toes on the line. See that green line? It's green for Ireland right there. Dan, come on up and give them some of, some of that wonderful fire. Come on, Dan. Just go right down this whole row right here. Say, fire for ire. Everybody, stretch your hand. Fire for ire. Fire on you, fire on you, fire, yes, fire on them, fire on them, yes, my God. Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus. We give you praise. We worship the King of kings and Lord of lords. Lord, let revival fire break out in every nation all over the earth for your great name's sake. What other nations do we have from Europe? Spain, España, Spain. And tell me, what do you think Arriba means? What does Arriba mean? Go higher. There you go, Dan. What other nations here? Austria. Great. What's that back there? Is that Norway? Sweden, Sweden, welcome. There is someone here from Finland, yeah, and you're from Norway. Have we missed any Europeans? All right, what about the rest of the world, real quick? If we haven't called your nation... You know, help me somebody. What does he say? Australia. Where are you from? The Ukraine. Yeah. Back here. Where? Sri Lanka. Wonderful. Where from? Japan. Lord. Bulgaria. And you. Bermuda, Bermuda, and where are you from? Korea, wow, how many are here from Korea? 
How many are here from Korea? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Let me have you run up here real quick and stand over on this side. Make some room for me there, guys. Come on, you Koreans. We'll pray for you. <clears throat> Ministry team, just move over. And we're going to pray for Korea. These, these folks have come a long, long way. Dan, where did you go? Come on back and pray for these Koreans. Give them some arriba. Stretch your hands toward them. Father, in the name of Jesus, we bless these folks that have come so far. I ask that the power of the Holy Ghost will come upon them now, and they would be filled, 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 filled. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Yeah. Come on, give it to them. Shiba. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord. I want to um, prepare for the offering tonight. We're having a mission offering that is going to two missions. The one last night that we mentioned is going towards the uh, renovations in our school of ministry. New school, showers in the room, all that kind of stuff. Won't it be great? And the other half is going towards our international leadership schools. And we have done these all around. There's been one in the Ukraine. There's been one in... Ghana, there's been one in, in, in uh, Brazil, and gosh, I don't know, we've done about six or seven of them. Um, and the next one coming up will be in Indonesia this September. And what we do is we go for a month with a team and a whole load of pastors, a hundred or more come in, and they get revolutionized by the power of the Holy Spirit and by all the Issues of the heart getting healed up, working through forgiveness, working through anger, hurts, fears, all that kind of stuff, and coming into a place of really knowing the Father's love and hearing the Father's voice. And I want you to pray tonight with me about sowing into the kingdom. Now, last night we put these on, on the chair back, these, these cards, I hope I mentioned them, did I? Uh, these are um, faith promise cards that have to do with this mission offering. And we, we take a mission offering up at every conference and then sow into these needs. <clears throat> and on that card is an opportunity to give a one-time gift. And you can give that by check or credit card or cash. And if you use cash, please also take an envelope with it and put your name in the envelope. Or you can give multiple times and help us, say, 12 times a year. That's what that's for. So, a monthly gift of whatever, you fill in the amount that God says, or a one-time gift of whatever. <clears throat> Notice there's a place where you can pay by credit card, where you check whether it's Visa or MasterCard or American Express. You need to fill your card number in carefully, the expiry date, you print your name so we know the name on the card, and then you sign it on both on that same line. All right? And um, you can tear this part off and stick that up on your fridge, and that's the faith part, see? Because God may give you a figure and you don't have it, so you've got to pray it in. You say, Lord, I want to help missions. I think one of the... We, well, we believe the very best uh, use of our time and money in terms of missions is to pour these values into our leaders' schools. And we do that with our own school of ministry here and send them out. And we also take those schools 
uh, to the nations, and it is just amazing. We did one a few months back with Dan in the Ukraine, and it was led by Carlos, who was a 22-year-old graduate of our school of ministry right here. He led the thing for a month, and it was a fantastic school. And so you're sowing into all of those values of raising up leaders and encouraging leaders and getting it all going. Now listen, if I took Carol out for a dinner, which I did the other night, it cost me $50 to take her for dinner. Two people. It's horrendous, really, isn't it? It's amazing how, you know, if you, if you take money out of your wallet and you, and you look at it, a $20 bill, I don't even know if I have one. I got an, a U.S. one. It looks so big in church, doesn't it? Oh, I don't want to put all that in the offering. 20 bucks, my gosh. No. But it looks so small when you go out to a restaurant. I don't know what it is. It looks like a $100 bill when you come into church and it's... You go into a restaurant, it looks like a five, you know. But I want you to pray about what God would have you to do. And if you could give up a nice dinner with you and your spouse or you and your friend or whatever, and say, Lord, I'm going to sow that into missions. You know, we'd have a great offering tonight. And maybe you want to say, you know what, I'm going to do that every month. Fifty bucks a month, the equivalent of a real nice dinner. I'm going to believe God for that every month because... I want to help these young people. I want to help get this thing going. So that's basically it. And if you um, if you get on board with the monthly gift, it's for one year only, 12 times, one year. We'll keep you posted on everything that we're doing, okay? Now, I have a video clip of the school that we did in Nigeria. And so I'm going to ask the guys if they'll just put that on for me right now. So this will give you an idea of what those kind of schools look like. We're in Abba, Nigeria. Last February, so what's that? Four months ago. that we may walk in God's love and then give it away. Duncan Smith oversees our youth network.
Blessed be your name, O Lord. Oh, yeah. Well, I was wanting to refer to the story of Jesus, the parable of the talents, or the minas, as it says in Greek. A certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. Reading from Luke 19:13, He called ten of his servants and delivered them ten minas and said to them, Do business till I come. <clears throat> and so it was, verse 15, when he returned, having received the kingdom, he then commanded these servants to whom he had given the money to be, to be called to him and that, that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. And then came the first saying, Master, your mina has earned ten minas. He said, Well done, good servant, because you were faithful in very little, have authority over ten cities. The second came saying, Master, your mina has earned five minas. Likewise, he said to him, be over five cities. And then another came saying, Master, here is your mina which I have kept put away in a handkerchief. For I feared you because you are an austere man. You collect what you did not deposit and reap what you did not sow. And he said to him, Out of your own mouth I will judge you, you wicked servant. Called him wicked. Called him a liar, which he was. You knew that I was an austere man, collecting what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow. Why then did you not put my money in the hand in the bank that at my coming I might have collected it with interest? And he said to those who stood, Take the miner from him. Give it to him who has ten. And they said, Master, he has ten. But I say to you that to everyone who has, <clears throat> more will be given. And to whom? Uh, he who does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. You know, it's an amazing thing when you stop and realize that everything you have has been a gift of God, either directly or through family and friends, hasn't it? Just take a moment and acknowledge, Lord, everything I have is from you. You made the job, you made the way, you gave the opportunities, etc. If you don't believe that, think about just what was it that you brought into the world when you first arrived. And think about what is it that you'll be taking with you when the time comes to leave this world. Well, you can, in a way, take it with you in terms of the kingdom. But see, God has put us in this place to be managers and stewards of that which he gives us. And when we're faithful over little, then, you know, he'll make you ruler over much. It's amazing. Be faithful with a little and, you know, here, rule over ten cities. That would be amazing. If you ever think of what ten cities in the world would you like to rule over? Yeah, I'd like Toronto to be one of mine. I really would, you know. I said, Lord, just give me this city. I'll sort it right out for you. Starting from the top down, we'll sort it out. But, you know, the call is to be faithful here when the full revelation of the kingdom is much more obscure. All of us will wish we'd given more when we get to heaven. I promise you that. Because there's rewards for faithfulness. That's why I say, why don't we pray? Can you take the hand of the person next to you? And let's pray. And say, Lord God, I want to hear from you. I don't want offerings and these things to ever become routine. I want to pray and ask you what I am to do. And then, in faith and obedience, I want to give that which you have spoken to my heart. Because, Lord, I realize that none of it is mine. It has all come from you. It's not my money, it's your money that I'm stewarding. And so I need to stop and ask you all the time, what do you want me to do with it? And Lord, as, I, as you find me trustworthy, you'll also find more and more and more is flowing through your hands. So tonight, speak, Lord. 
We are listening. Whatever you'd have us to do. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now, when God gives you a figure, don't rationalize. Say, oh, that's way too much. And, uh, you know, quarter it or something like that. Just believe him. Say, okay, Lord, if that was you, then I'm going to trust you. And just see exactly what you do. <clears throat> you know, I don't, I don't think I told the story here, but we felt led of the Lord to give away our entire Sunday offering about a month ago. And we didn't feel in the natural. We couldn't afford it, but we just felt we needed to do that. And we sowed the whole thing. It was so much fun. We sowed into vineyard churches here and there. We sowed into missions here and there. I took some to Russia and the Ukraine. And, boy, we were able to peel off like 500 bucks. Here, pastor, be blessed. Here, pastor, be blessed. Here, pastor, be blessed. And for them, like 500 bucks is a year's salary. And we just sowed it out there. Dan was with me. It was great, wasn't it? You know what? God is making that up manifold because what we're doing with our school of ministry is selling the old school building, severing the parking lot off, and redeveloping the uh, office building over here with a second floor and everything else since where all the renovations will go. But the blessing of God coming on it Right away, right after we did that, we, we got two guys. You know, the best thing that can happen in any real estate deal is you got two people that really, really want it, and they start this bidding war, you know. And that's exactly what happened. And let me just say that we got our offering back probably times ten because of that bidding war. Isn't that great? That's how it works. It works with churches. It works with individuals. You know, you can't outgive God. So learn to be generous. If if you've tried this before and it's never worked for you and you felt manipulated and coerced, well, I'm sorry about that. That's not God's way. That's not His heart. That's not the Bible way. Have another think about this and say, Lord, I want to learn to give lovingly and in faith and in obedience because I want to enter into the blessing that you have for me. That's all it is. All right? If you're making a check, make it to TACF. Fill in your visa. Get your cards ready. Hold it up for the Lord. And say, Father, in the name of Jesus, I am sowing into missions tonight for the glory of God. In your holy name, Lord. Amen. All right, ushers, pass the offering baskets, if you will. Just want to give you the heads up on some conferences coming up in the fall. In July, we have the Party is Here conference, which is basically a, a lot of fun all the time. And uh, it's, a, it's a great time. To, it's a free conference. But we like to just let the Holy Spirit run as much as we can. We also have Latin America on Fire in September. This is a conference that's going to be spoken in Spanish and Portuguese and translated into English. So that's good. We also have our Catch the Fire conference in October and a new one, Signs and Wonders in the Kingdom, in November. So if you want information about those, we have um, brochures and postcards in the foyer. There's also tomorrow, we have John and Christine Potter leading worship all day. And uh, in the morning, John's going to be speaking on how to pastor prophets. So for all you pastors out there, that's an absolute must to be there. <laughs> All right, and in January we'll be having our pastors' conference and we'll be having our school of leaders and the school of, what are we calling it, the Signs and Wonders School. And in February, in case you haven't heard, we're doing a conference not in the river but on the ocean. All right, it's a cruise with Royal Caribbean. And it's just going to be a hot time. We've got about 500 people signed on already. How many would be interested in coming cruising with us? Oh, my. What we're going to do is have a full-on conference at sea. We're going into, I believe it's Puerto Rico, at least one of the stops, and doing a crusade meetings in there and take, take, take the whole ship with us, and we're just going 
burn up the island, you know. And so it's going to be a wonderful time. Let me see again. How many are interested in that? Well, there's some ladies out in the foyer right there, and they've got information about that. I think they gave you some when you came in um, Wednesday. But check with them and get your deposits in ASAP because the price only goes up. You know how that goes. Now, let me just say this about a Christian cruise. <clears throat> the ship is really nervous about it. Let me tell you why. They don't drink very much. And they don't play in the casino very much. So they're afraid that they're going to lose money. So they're looking for ways they can jack up the, the price as time goes on, see? So get your deposit in, and that locks it in. All right, let's stand together, shall we? We'll have one more worship time together, and then Steve Witt will come.
everyone say Ariba and then you can be seated. I've seen everything now. Guillotines. People were shooting me earlier. So we got fire squad, guillotines. It's amazing. <laughs> well, I feel the Lord put me in a little bit of a different direction here. So if you do get the tape, it will say interpreting your life, which will have nothing to do with what I speak on right now, but just so you know. <clears throat> the ti- you interpret the title. That's the... Uh... But what I felt, I-, I felt as Dan was walking around here, something was stir- really stirring in me about aggressive Christianity <clears throat> and the need for prophetic people to no longer lay back and be the tolerant individuals that many of us have been. You know, the Bible has several job descriptions that are laid out. One of them, of course, is the devil. And and he does his job pretty well. He's out to rob, to kill, and destroy. And he's out there right now in the nations. And the reason even Dan, as he's walking around and there's, you know, you see this incredible manifestation of a smile on his face is because he's in a country that's been so ravaged by so much and he's taking it back. He and many others. Because they realize the enemy is to rob, kill, and destroy. The Bible says that Jesus came that we might have life and we might have it abundantly. God's called us to walk in that abundant life. And as prophetic intercessors, prophetic and intercessors, that God's raising up all over, and especially you here tonight, I think there's an assertiveness and aggressiveness that God's stirring in our hearts and calling us into a into a new place. You know, just a few weeks ago, I was really meditating on this whole thing because I, I have been, there's been so many battles I've had to walk through, but the way I battle now is different than the way I battled in the past. And a lot of it is because of what the Holy Spirit's done in my heart since coming to Toronto in 1994. I was thinking through, I, you know, I mentioned in my other sessions, I've, I've been going to church since I was two weeks old. I've been a Christian since I was eight. I've seen really a lot in a short time. And uh, I remember back in the, the 70s, you know, during the Jesus movement, the United States and Canada especially, really around the world. And there was something, you know, because of the whole, uh, in the United States particularly because of the Vietnam War, there was a real peace movement. And that kind of filtered into the church as millions of young people came to know the Lord. And it affected the music. I've watched as each decade the music in the church has been affected. You know, in the 70s, we had a real, we just had kind of a peace, love, heart, you know, and we were like, I mean, the songs that came out were, you know, Kumbaya, my Lord, you know, old African songs, and we just, we just wanted to kind of be in a circle and love one another and have peace because we were tired of the violence, you know. Many of the streets and the cities in America were on fire, there were riots all over the place, and so as Jesus started moving across our nation, it started to bring out songs, very simple songs. Now, many of you probably remember some of them. We'd sing them around the campfire, you know. Only takes a spark. Man, in this church, it doesn't even take a spark. <sighs> to get a fire going, to send all those around. We'll warm up to its glowing. See, we didn't know what was coming. That felt really good, you know, and it was that kind of an atmosphere. And then the 80s came. And something happened in the 80s, and I don't know what it was, but a militancy came on the church. And you could see it in the songs that we sang. I mean, we were doing, we were, we were jumping and running, and, you know, we were going to rush on the city and run on the walls, and great is the army, and we, we run through the troop, and we leap over the walls, and we did that for about 10 years. And we, and we got wore out. And then the 90s came. 
And that's why the Toronto blessing 10 years ago was so timely. Because we had the love of God in the 70s, and let's just be together in community and love God, love one another. And then the 80s was just this militant time. Everywhere you went, people were getting sweaty and waving banners and excited and running and jumping. And then by the 90s, we were, we were, we were out. And we started singing songs like, uh, I will worship with all of my heart. Let me know the kisses of your mouth. Let me feel your embrace. Take me away with you. <laughs> Even so, Lord, come. What happened to the 80s? We just wore out. Like, uh, I, I just want you, Lord. Find me in the river. Find me there. Find me on my knees with my soul laid bare. So I've been watching these past four years. Because we're in a new decade, a new century. Something's kind of happening right now. And I think there's a stir of a blending of a lot of different things that God's been doing. He's taken a little bit of the old He's taking some of the new. He's taking some of the things that maybe you've got rid of and thought God's not going to use anymore, and He's brought it in there. And He's starting to shake it up. And boy, He's rolling the dice right now. Some really exciting things are starting to come out in the church. Because what I see emerging is a group of people across the nations that know how to move into the intimacy of the Lord, but don't be fooled. Underneath that loving exterior are valiant Ariba warriors. <laughs> turn, with me to, turn to Genesis 14. I just want to look at two of these. I'm going to speak very short because we got the ministry team or the uh, school of ministry tonight. One reason, it's 940, but anyway. School of ministry and a few others are going to prophesy over everybody in this room tonight. So if you came here looking for a word, we're going to believe that God's going to give you a word here in just a few moments. Turn to Genesis 14. I want to talk about someone I've been studying a lot over the past two months, and that's Abraham. Abraham was a gentle soul. You know, a week ago on... American TV, there was this young kid, he was about probably 10 years old in Florida, who was attacked by an alligator. They interviewed him the next day. I don't know if any of you saw it on TV, but he's just a young guy. He's been attacked by an alligator. And he had, a, like, bandages all around his head. And they interviewed him. He's only 10. They said, well, what happened? He said, the alligator bit me. And that was really all he said. And they said, what'd you do? I punched him in the nose. And then what did the alligator do? He swam away. I thought that's theology right there in a nutshell. Enemy comes in, punch him in the nose, he swims away. Resist the enemy, the devil, and he will flee from you. But see, many of us have been in this tolerant thing because of the love of God. I mean, it's been very good. But we really believe that His love is this kind of a gentle love that has never aroused something greater that God's called us to. Abraham, up to this point in Scripture, in Genesis 14, was really a nomadic individual. In fact, there's another word that describes him, and it slips in my mind right now. He wasn't a true nomad. He kind of went to a place. He'd stay there for a while. He'd go to another place, he'd stay there for a while, and he kind of kept moving. We find out later on in Scripture that we're searching for a city whose builder and maker was God. He was on a mandate, a destiny set by God. But we find, really, he's just a, a sheep herder. I mean, and his, his flocks begin to grow larger, and, and he's just somebody who's out there in a the sheep. I mean, a shepherd, you'd think, would be a fairly gentle man. I know he's strong, he's got to protect his sheep and everything. 
But for the most part, he's out there with animals just going, bah, all day long. He can sing. He can worship. He's seeking God. But look what happens right here in Genesis 14. I, just, I mean, I've read this many, many times, but I stumbled upon it a few weeks ago, and I thought, this is really interesting. Look at verse 11. Abram had a nephew named Lot. And you remember the deal that took place uh, prior to this. They were, came to a place where their flocks were growing so large, and some of the shepherds were arguing with one another. And so Abram led to the Lord. He said, okay, Lot, here's the deal. You, you can make a choice. You can, uh, now you, can, you, can, you can pick where you want to go. And the Bible says that he pitched his tent towards Sodom. We find out later on he's actually living in Sodom. Let that be a lesson to all of us. If you put your tent near Sodom, you will eventually live in Sodom. But Abram was stuck with kind of the barren mountains, and he went up there, and I don't know if he's discouraged. He may have just made a, been a man full of faith, but God said, lift up your eyes and look around for everywhere you look, I'm going to give it to you. So Abram was fairly sure that, God, you've given me a destiny, you've given me a purpose. But what happens in the midst of it, Sodom is invaded. It's, it's ransacked by kind of rebellious kings. And they take Lot and his family. We pick this up in verse 11. Then they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their provisions and went their way. They also took Lot, Abram's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom and his goods, and they departed. Verse 13. Then one who had escaped came and told Abram the Hebrew, for he dwelt in the terrible trees of Mamre the Amorite, brother of Esco and brother of Aner, and they were allies with Abram. Well, I made it through that. Verse 14. Now when Abram heard, everyone say heard. When Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his 318 train servants who were born in his own house. That's a big family. And he went in pursuit as far as Dan. He divided his forces against them by night. And his servants attacked them and pursued them as far as Hobah, which is north of Damascus. Hey, this, is a, this is a sheep herder. He's just there and, and the sheep. You know, the, the messenger comes and says, Abram, your brother's son has been taken captive. And when he heard that, he instantly transformed from this peaceful shepherd into a valiant warrior. He comes to the place where something stirred within him. Now, I've had this happen many times in my life, and I haven't always responded right. I remember years ago in 1984, my wife was pregnant with our second daughter. And, uh, you know, things were going along Okay. We were recovering from my wife just having a, a miscarriage really months before, and it was a very difficult time. I was in a very difficult time in my life, very wounded, very hurt, just had a miscarriage. You're getting this sense of, God, is God judging me? I mean, your theology goes out the door. You start moving on your feelings if you're not based in a strong faith. And I was being hammered by the enemy. And even friends and those around me were, were, were agreeing, kind of like Job's comforters, you know. You must have done something wrong. God's really ticked. And so there we are, and in the midst of this, about four months into the pregnancy, my wife, her physical body gets, begins to gear up for another miscarriage. And at first, my initial thought was, oh, no, another miscarriage. I'm out of work. I, I had no job. The house payments are coming in, everything else. And I just thought, man, it's not just one, but it's two. But deep inside, as I went before the Lord, I was crying really out of self-pity. It was like, I, I understand why this is happening to me, and this is difficult. And something inside of me, and I think it had something to do with my praying mother that I've been telling you about. Something deep inside, it was a little light that shook me out of my passivity. It said, wait a minute, this cannot happen. And the aggressive spirit started to merge out of me. And I know some people judge aggressive people, especially in the church. You go, well, that's just not my style. That's not my model. Well, sometimes it needs to be your model. Sometimes we need to shake ourselves out of that passivity and say, wait a minute. I am being robbed. And I'm going after the enemy. I'm going to pursue him. And I'm going to get everything back. Abram, he's the shepherd. I'm sure he was not a violent man. There's no record of him being a violent man. He's just bad. He's up with the 
sheep, but when he hears about the problem in his family, immediately he turns into this military warrior. He brings his men together and he says, let's go after him. And I love it because look at verse 16. It says, and he brought back all the goods and also brought back his brother Lot and his goods as well as the women and the people. That's one strong warrior. He got everything back. So I started praying that prayer with my wife. I mean, we got aggressive. I said, Cindy, we cannot lay back right now. We started recruiting prayer people. We started speaking into the womb. We spoke over this little baby. We said, we, we're, we're praying for you. We didn't have, a, didn't have a name picked out for you yet. We knew it was a little girl. We'd seen some ultrasounds of her. We just started praying over her and saying, you must stand there. And, and God gave us wisdom in that moment. Doctors are wanting to do things, give you her medication and stuff that, I mean, probably would be okay to use in a normal situation, but in that particular time we resisted it, said, no, we're going we're gonna to rise or we're going to stand on God's Word. Now, I'm not saying that every time that's the way you do it, but that's what we felt we were supposed to do. And we realized you could lose this baby, everything in her body. The doctor said, I, I don't know what to say, you're going to lose this baby. We just started praying. We started answering. I, I mean, I went after this thing. Half of it was out of my own fear and own, own concern. Half of it was crying out to God. Half of it was holding Him to account on things that He had prophesied through others to me over the years, saying, Lord, this cannot happen. Lord, I am your child. I went after it, man. I wrestled with God. I came out with a limp, but I wrestled with God. And He changed me in the midst of that. Well, you know what? She went full term. She gave birth to a little girl. And I remember we named her Lauren. And, I, you know, I, usually I'm really up on names and everything, but I wasn't totally sure what it was, and I went and looked it up in the book. Lauren comes from the word laurel wreath. It's the wreath that you put around someone who's victorious. It means victorious one. And so the Lord's been teaching me a few things. And even in this renewal, I found in the early days, I became kind of passive just because we were soaking. I mean, really, and it was the Word of the Lord. I mean, some of us, we come out of the 80s, we were so wore out, we were, find me in the river, find me there, find me uh, on my knees with my soul laid bare. It's like, Lord, really? Thank God, Lord. You're a I mean, that's the way I was when I came here. In the old building. And God just, I mean, He just had His way with me. I was just, oh. I got up nine times in three days. I was just struck out in the floor. Three times I fell asleep and had one of the most awesome, three of the most awesome rests that I'd ever had in years. On the floor, up front, while John was preaching. I was getting it through osmosis. I mean, it was just one of those times of resting. And it's that great time of recharging. It's going on in your spirit. And so I came up and just thought, well, this is the new thing. We're just going to sing songs about the love of the Lord. And we did, and it's really true, and it's good. But I forgot that there's still that aggressive side. He's called us as the loving lambs, but as a takeoff of the old movie back in the 70s of uh, when Sylvester Stallone went after some, some MIAs that were lost in Vietnam. Remember the show, the, the movie Rambo? Well, he's calling us as Lambos. Lambs that are very calm and very peaceful, but if you start poking us too much, we go after the powers of darkness, we seize them and bring them back. Now, I know some of you are saying, no, I don't receive this. I'm a New Testament Christian. That's Old Testament. I model my life after Jesus. Lamb of God. Lion of the tribe of Judah. The Lamb of God. Mighty warrior. Lamb of God. Lover of my soul. Really, let's just read about this Lamb of God. Turn, turn to John just for a moment. I won't hold you long. John chapter 10, verse 10 through 15. I think God is emerging a group of intercessors and prophets that really are peaceful, loving people. 
I mean, deep in our hearts, we really don't want to hurt anybody. We just want to love God. We want to soak in His presence. We want to wait on Him. But we're also a people that when we are attacked or our family in the church of God is attacked. We've had a number of, of attacks of cancer in our church over the past few years. We've lost a couple battles, but we've also won some. I mean, one, one 14-year-old boy, they gave him a 30% chance of living. We prayed for him. Of course, he was going through some of the medical stuff. We prayed for him. You know, he's with us. How old is he, Tim? He's 18 now. He's 18 years old now. The doctor said he's cancer-free. I mean, we thank God for that. <clears throat> but you know what? We went after it. I'm not saying every day, but we had intercessors going after it. We had a prayer wall. We wrote things all about him. In fact, we're getting ready to move. We're getting ready to move to a new building, and we're going to literally cut out that wall and take it to our new building. Because it's a, it's a memory of a church that stood together when somebody was robbed. We went back and we took it back. We're a loving people. We soak too. We lay around and worship the Lord, meditate in His presence. We have potlucks. We eat fried chicken. <clears throat> but something about Metro Church South, if you touch the right button, the roar of a lion, the roar of a warrior comes out. And Jesus exemplifies this. Look at John chapter 10. Verse 10, it says, The thief does not come except to steal, to kill, and destroy. But I have come that they may have life and they may have it more abundantly. Now, Jesus clarifies it here in verse 11. He says, I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But a hireling, and hopefully there's no hirelings in here, a hireling, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming, leaves the sheep, and flees. I'm out of here. We had a guy leave our church a couple years ago because he said he felt our church was under a curse. He said too many people are getting cancer. There's marital problems in this church. God's not here and I'm getting out of here before I get it. Well, see, when I read this, I think of him. When the wolf comes in, he leaves the sheep and flees. I was reading about George Washington just the other day and when he was marching through New Jersey trying to find his way. He was being pursued by the enemy at that point so close that, that the rear guards could hear the music of the enemy behind them. Losing up to hundreds of people a day. Just hurting. They had no shoes. They were broken. They were hurt. All these things. But George held together. And we've been on the spot where one of our pastors in Washington Crossing, Pennsylvania, where Washington and apparently his five thousand troops knelt down and began to pray. And then they crossed the Delaware. And God gave them a mighty victory down in Trenton. So they came to a place where they realized we are not going to back off of the enemy. That's the hireling spirit. It says here, verse 12, you see the wolf coming, you leave the sheep and flee. And the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. But look at verse 13. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. True men and women of God care about their brothers and sisters. They care about what's going on. When one hurts, the others hurt. When one mourns, the others mourn. When one rejoices, the others rejoice. God's calling a spirit of community like there was in the 70s to come back to the church again. And I think this emerging generation right now, those that are about 25 and under, they're demanding it in the spirit. They're saying we need mentors. We need loving relationships and fellowship. It's going to return again. It's going to be very much, I believe, like the Jesus movement was in the 70s. But it's got added on there a warrior spirit. It's got added on there a sensitive weight on God's spirit. Would you imagine when you start blending all that together? Is it possible that some of you old folks that are 48 and over, that God may have combined together all of the stuff of the past three or four decades and compressed it into your very spirit that you might be one that walks in such a way as a gentle lamb but is aroused to be a mighty warrior? I think so. Jesus in verse 14 says this, I am the good shepherd. 
He really is the example. And I know my sheep. And you're there like, that's right, that's right, Jesus. He's the shepherd. That's what I said. The loving shepherd. That's right. He says, and I know my sheep and am known by my own. Verse 15. And as the Father knows me, even so I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. There's the warrior spirit within him that says, I will not allow a wolf to come in and scatter my sheep. A good shepherd, but calling back and saying, you will not rob us, you will not steal us any longer, steal from us any longer. You know, a couple of years ago, my wife was, uh, uh, she was going up to the store and um, we were out talking in the yard, we had a van, and uh she set her vert purse, her purse on the, the, the bumper of the van as we were talking, and then forgot about it, got in the car, and drove off. And halfway to the mall, she realized, oh no, where's my purse? And she started reflecting back in her mind, remembered, I set it on the bumper. <gasps> and so she quickly stopped and began to backtrack, and we, we couldn't find them. I mean, it was nowhere around. And so later on, she was panicking. There was money in there. Of course, all the credit cards and things like that that people can, you know. And, and worst of all, her makeup, all her makeup was in there. <clears throat> Not serious stuff, I'll tell you. So, so our whole family, we fanned out. We, we retraced it. And we came to this place. You know, oddly enough, this has nothing to do with my message, but oddly enough, the purse was lost on the property that we just bought. Go figure. But anyway, we, we go there and we, we find a, a, a little tube of lipstick. That's all that's left. Everything else is gone. We thought, well, it's right here, but where's the purse? It's gone. Now, again, normally when that happens, you'd say, it's gone. Call the credit card, card companies. We did that. We canceled it. All that, you all know. And she was really stressed because this purse, I forget the name of it, but it was one of these special purses that, you know, cost like a gazillion zillion dollars, but she only paid like 30 for it, you know. And, and so she, this was like, Steve, I've got to get that purse back. I said, okay. So we just started praying. And we said, Lord, we, we call for it, that prodigal purse. <laughs> we did. We even, we even went to church on Sunday morning. I, I told the whole church, you know, it's one of the benefits of being a pastor. I said, you know what? My wife lost her purse the other day. I didn't tell the story. I didn't want to embarrass her. I said, we lost the purse. So we call that purse back home. Church was right with it. Yeah. And they went after it in faith. They covered the entire country, scanning for that purse. Come home. Come home. They're calling it home. They personified it. Purse, come home. In the name of Jesus. i got to tell you, I didn't have a whole lot of faith for it. I thought, you know, I don't know. But I'll do it, you know. I'll pray in faith. And so days go by. Two weeks go by. And the purse, my neighbor from next door walks over and says, Hey, we came home today and this purse was at the front door of our house. It, it didn't make it all the way home. It was probably an embarrassed purse. But it just went to the, it went to the house next door. And guess what? All the makeup was still in there. Some of the money was gone. Credit cards didn't matter. We'd already canceled them. Her driver's license was there. That's a big headache getting that again, you know. But the big thing was, Steve, the purse is back. This whatever it is. I wish I knew the name of it. This purse. You ladies would know. It's just got a scratch on the side. Well, a guy that does leather in our church, he fixed that. It was as good as new. I started thinking about it. I thought, you know what? We can call all kinds of things home. I've allowed the enemy to attack my finances. Just said, oh, well, it's just bad. The washer and the dryer went bad last week. I guess that's just what happens. Well, my car, I got that, I got that parking ticket last week. I thought I was in the right spot. Well, I guess it just happens. And left and right, the enemy starts coming in. He's robbing our children. He's robbing our lives. He's coming in. And we're just like, well, I just want to love the Lord. I love Him. But the Holy Spirit's wanting to build within us that aggressive spirit that says, no, I'm going after it. You know, when I was in Canada, and this came to me came to me a few weeks ago when I was living in Canada, my kids, they've always wanted a pet. And, uh, you know, we weren't real excited about that uh, just because we know we'd end up taking care of it, you know. So, uh we uh 
We finally got him a bunny rabbit. We thought that was like the least problematic pet that you could get. We chose a very unique prophetic name, Bugs. <clears throat> Bugs got out of his bin one day, <clears throat> and he ran away. i got to tell you, I wasn't real upset about it. I said, well, that must be the Lord's will, kids. I tried to put a really good spin on it. I said, you know, Bugs was good. We loved him. He loved us. But people move on. And rabbits move on. But I remember my kids, my older kids, they were not that old at that I mean, they were like, I don't know, 10 maybe, 11, 12. I got four children. And I, we were on our way to a meeting, a church meeting. It was actually a renewal meeting. And on the way there, my daughter in the back seat, they were just, they were just torn about this rabbit being gone, you know. And I realized, oh man, I'm a terrible dad. You know, I need to, I need to give a little, I said, I know, I know, he was a good rabbit. I was like I was doing a memorial service for the rabbit. And my daughter says, Dad, we need to ask God to bring the rabbit back home. I was kind of trapped. So I thought, I don't want the rabbit back home. If I ask God, he might bring the rabbit back home. And they insisted, Megan, my old star, she said, Dad, let's pray right now. Let's pray that Bugs will come home. Okay? So I prayed a prayer. And I got to admit, there was not an ounce of faith attached to it, but there was in the back seat. I just prayed a prayer. I said, Lord, wherever Bugs is, I just pray, Lord, you'd protect him, keep him safe. And Lord, if it be your will. <laughs> bring bugs home. And they're really excited about it, you know. So, a couple weeks goes by, and uh, the, the bugs was one of those dwarf bunnies. He was smaller than all the other bunnies. And I'm thinking, you know, we're in the wilds of Canada, eastern Canada. A, a, a pet rabbit, you know, does not last very long in that part of the country. There's foxes and all kinds of things out there. You know, bugs is probably in heaven right now. It's very, it's very possible He's with the Lord, and we just need to thank the Lord for that. We're coming home from a renewal meeting. Two weeks later, we turn the corner. We're coming up this, like, angled road, coming around in behind my house, and this rabbit jumps in front of the car lights. And everyone in the back seat said, Bugs! I thought, oh, my gracious, it is Bugs. We got out of the car, and the headlights were on Bugs. He's over in the ditch. He realized he had been cornered. And he had his eyes on the kids, and I snuck over behind him. Hey, Bugs. Shoot, shoot. No, I'm going, hey, Bugs. I said, hey, look. And I did my fingers like this, and Bugs was mesmerized by it. And as he did, I reached him behind him. Ah, I got him. And when I did, his legs were going all over the place. Kids were screaming and yelling. We took Bugs back in, put him in his bin. He wasn't real excited, but the kids were ecstatic. We prayed, and God brought Bugs home. <clears throat> That's really important stuff, I want to tell you. You know, the Lord just spoke to me through that. He's been dealing with me a long time saying, are there things that I just kind of let go? Are there things that I'm tolerant of or passive about that actually, yes, I'm a loving shepherd. Yes, I want to be a soaker in the presence of God. Yes, I want the Father's love. But maybe God's building into the church right now those intercessory prophetic warriors that will not just sit and wait and soak, but understand there's a point where they are touched by something of the enemy's attacks against the church or their nation. And this time in Canada right now, it's not a time to just be tolerant or passive. Well, I'm watching it from the United States where things were clearly stated and they were lies. And it's time for Canada in prayer to rise up and say, no more of this stuff. I lived here ten years. And many times I was disturbed by the, by the tolerance that was there. I said, you know, Christians truly need to say, we are taking back our government for the Lord Jesus Christ. And the same thing goes on in the United States and probably in countries all around the world. Let me close with this. Turn to 1 Samuel. One more shepherd story. 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel. 17. A little shepherd named David. Remember him? His brothers discounted him. Because he's just shepherd boy. 
And remember the giant comes in, the Philistine giant. And for something like, I think it was 40 days, he taunts Israel. He comes out there every morning after his breakfast and says, ha, ha, ha. Send somebody out here. Let's settle this like men. We don't need to bring our armies against one another. Bring a man out here. And he taunted them constantly. I'll fight him. If you win, we'll be your slaves. If I win, you'll be our slaves. I mean, nobody in Israel came close to this guy. He was a giant. He had some brothers, and they were big too. So David just happens in, sent by his father with comes to lunch for all the boys, and he comes into the foxhole, and he's looking out there. What's going on? They go, oh, what are you doing here? Go back to your sheep. Really, that was their attitude. What do you come here for? To mock us or something? Well, well what's going on? And he, see, he's, an, he's a shepherd, but there's something within that says, wait a minute. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine to say these things about our God? I mean, something that is disturbed in his spirit. And the word gets out. Of course, the king hears about it. King Saul, they pull in David. You know, they say, well, maybe, you know, he's the best shot we've got. Uh, I don't know. He doesn't really even have a weapon. So they try to put Saul's armor on him. It doesn't fit. David lays out his qualifications and says, look, I'm a shepherd boy. But when the bear came and tried to get my sheep, I took him apart. When the lion came and tried to take my sheep, I took him apart. Minutes later, and I love it, and you know what, I'm not even going to read it here, but what happens is he goes out there and Goliath sees him and begins to mock him like, what are you doing? You think I'm a dog? You're bringing little sticks out here? What are you doing? Is this your little boy that you send out here? And David, and this is really cool, he prophesies to his destiny in that moment. He says, you come to me with a sword, but I come to you in the name of the Lord. And this day I will cut off your head and I will feed your body to the vultures. Can you imagine what that might have sounded like? That's the guy that's prophesying into his destiny. And then the Bible says he ran to Goliath. You know, it's not like he's strategizing, what's the best shot I can get? He's like, oh, oh, oh. Yeah, I mean, Goliath was like, this is ridiculous. He doesn't even have a weapon. But you know what he did? He got one of those stones out. He released that stone. It hit Goliath in the forehead. The Goliath tumbled down. The Bible doesn't say that he died. It might have just stunned him. But David didn't waste any time. This little shepherd boy, nah. Inside, he's just a little lamb. But maybe he's a lamb bow. And when he's touched in a certain way, something rose up within him. And he says, who are we to be taunted by this enemy? We are God's people, and we're going to stand up against it. And he did. You see, you know what he does? And I know this probably grosses some of you out, but he went up there. He took the enemy's sword and hacked the head off. It probably didn't come off easy. It was... And he showed it around. I mean, the Philistines were... Freaked out. A young, prophetic shepherd boy. By the way, he was a man after God's own heart. You talk about a soaker. He knew what it was like to lay out in the grass with his harp and just, Find me in the river. Find me there. Find me on my knees with my soul laid bare. But if you heard one of his lambs go, eh, meh, He was up and after him. The lion, the bear, whatever came in. Something of a spirit that was within him that said, No longer will I be stolen from. Now let's all stand together. You know, in 1986, there's no, no connection here, but when I first moved to Canada, I went into a deep depression. I did. I, I did. It was terrible. I was attacked. In fact, in, in a very short period of time, in just a few months, I had 22 major and minor illnesses. I was seeing double vision. Uh, I lost my memory several times. Didn't know who I was. I mean, it was terrible. The, the attack was just unbelievable. I was living in St. John, New Brunswick. I was wanting to plant a church. And one day I came home. 
And I was just defeated. I mean, I was, pray, I, you know, sometimes you get in a place where it's like, I, I'd love to be a warrior if I could just get out of bed. I mean, you're, you're broken. And my wife came in. She's, she saw me in that state once before. And uh, she said, well, watch this video. And she put a video in. I've talked about it when I've been here before. A guy named Don Stewart, kind of a faith preacher out of Dallas. He was in excuse me, Dallas, Texas on the uh, video. And uh, I'm laying there in bed. I mean, I have double I got a cold rag on my head. I'm defeated. I've only been in Canada a few months. I mean, everyone's against me. The ministerial, they gathered together and tried to label us a cult and drive me out of town. I mean, this is bad stuff, you know. Our church started out with 27 people, and the next week grew to 11. I mean, so you're like, we had 100 fog days my first year in St. John. No summer. We didn't have it that year, 1986. I wore my jacket all summer, and I thought, Lord, I hear you right. Maybe you said St. John. Isn't there somewhere in the Caribbean, St. John? And um, I was laying there. My wife puts this video in. And this is in Dallas, Texas. It's a video, actually, the friend of ours had given us. And on the, on the, on the video, the, the person hosting the meeting hands, hands the mic down to this Don Stewart guy. He comes up on the stage, and the band's playing and everything. And he says, uh, prophesy to the nation. And there's like 5,000 people there. <clears throat> and so the, the, the camera's panning the crowd, and you just see them. Like you, you hear this roar, like, wow. And you can't hear what they're saying, but you just see. I mean, there's this aggressive spirit coming out of them. And I watched it. I've seen that stuff before. I was like, well, oh, whatever. i got a headache. I, you know, I'm not feeling well. I'm depressed. You know? I mean, it just wasn't doing it. And then Don Stewart jumps down off the stage and he, he goes to a woman in the second row, and he hands her the mic. This is in Dallas, Texas, on the tape. He says, what nation are you prophesying over? She said, Canada! And when she said that, something like, I mean, it was like, it was like lightning went through my body. I jumped up off of the sofa. Don Stewart steps back, and this was like months before. It's amazing how God can contain anointing on a tape like that. It was months before, and he speaks to the crowd. He says, prophesy over Canada. And now those 5,000 people, they didn't know it, but they were prophesying over one young guy in St. John, New Brunswick, who had just about given up. The warrior spirit came back in. You know, I lasted there for 10 years. We built a great church out there and many other churches. You know, some of you have lost your warrior spirit. And God's wanting to put something back in you even right now. Let's just wait in the presence of the Lord. Just close your eyes for a minute but because there's several, several situations we want to minister to. In fact, we want to prophesy over everyone here shortly. So if you hang out, you're going to get, you're going to get prophetic ministry. But right now, as we're waiting, and I want everyone, please intercede right now. If there's anyone here tonight that does not know Jesus Christ, maybe you've been away from the Lord. Maybe you've never asked Jesus into your heart. Some people wonder, you know, and I'd ask the question, if you died tonight, I've heard this ever since I was a little boy, and it's really true. If you died tonight, do you know for certain that you would make heaven your home? You've got to ask yourself that. Now, in your heart, you might say, well, nobody knows that for certain. The Bible would contend with that. The Bible says that you may know that you have eternal life. So right now tonight, if you're in a place where you say, I do not know, if I died right now, I do not know that I would have eternal life. All around the room, everybody's just praying right now. Just pray for a moment. We want to make sure that we're all on the same page here before we begin more ministry. If you say in your heart, if you died right now, you say, I do not know that I would make, I would make heaven my home. And I want to know for certain. If that's you right now, I want you to raise your hand just around the room. Raise your hand. Anyone here, just raise your hand around the room. You say, I do not know for certain that I would make heaven my home. And I can't, I may not be able to see everyone here, so if there's someone raising their hand, just, just point them out. I want to make sure I don't miss them. There's a few back here. Okay, I want to ask you to do something. My intention is, is obviously not to embarrass you in any way, but I want to, we want to pray for you. And also, there's some literature we would like to give you. If you could make your way out of your seat right now, and everybody else, keep praying, because I think there's a few more. If you could just make your way up here to the front, 
And let's just welcome them up to the front. Those of you who raised your hand, just come on up here and stand in the front. Come on up. We want to pray for you. If you want to bring a friend up with you, that's okay too, but just make your way up to the front. If you are not for certain that tonight if you died or something happened to you, that you would make heaven your home, please keep on coming right now. Let's keep welcoming up here. Just clap your hands to the Lord. That's yeah, right. Come right over here. Right on the green line. You just come right over here. It's okay. There's more here. Keep coming. There's a few more here. We don't want to miss anybody. This is such an exciting thing. All of heaven rejoices when one soul... That's why I think in heaven there's constant rejoicing because there's constantly new souls coming into the kingdom of God. Now, we want to pray for you just for a minute. And then so there's some uh, counselors and helpers that are going to take you in a side room. They've got some literature to give you. And they'll pray for you. In fact, any needs you have, like if you need healing or you need a touch of God, they'll be glad to pray for you uh, uh, for that too. But before you leave, I want a chance to pray for you too. If everyone here would just stretch forth your hand to those that are up here in the front. Lord, we just thank you, Lord, what you're doing right now in their heart. I thank you, Lord, that this is the first time that they're rising up and saying, I'm going after God, and I'm going to take everything that God has for me. I bless them right now with the strength of the Lord to make firm and strong heart decisions to follow Jesus. In prayer, we build a fiery hedge around them right now that they may be protected, and they're going to go all the way through to the other end to know Jesus Christ fully, that they may know His presence, they may know the Father's love that would be deep in their spirit. In Jesus' name, we thank you, Lord. Amen. Okay, they're going to lead you in prayer in the other room. If you just follow them, let's thank the Lord again for them. Bless you. All right. Now, here's the second prayer. We're going to pray. We're going to do three things tonight. That was number one. Number two is we're going to pray for some other people. Number three, we're going to do the prophetic thing. We're going to minister over a lot of people here in a short period of time. But the second group I want to minister to right now is those of you, as I was talking, some of you, that you know you've been robbed. Now, I know some of you, it's even children that you haven't communicated with in a long time. Or teenagers that have obviously turned in a direction and you feel like that your your hands are tied, that you can't really bring them back. I'm telling you, in prayer right now, like Abram, the gentle shepherd, will go after them and bring them back with all their goods. That can happen. If you've been robbed financially, we're going to go after it right now in prayer. If you've been robbed physically, we're going to go after it right now in prayer. Now, I believe... I believe there's so many people that fall in this category that I'm not going to ask you to come to the front. But I'd like you to raise your hand right now if that's you all around this room. I mean, you want to go after something. Keep your hand raised just for a minute. We probably have more hands raised than there are people to pray. So what I'm going to have you do is I'm going to have you gently lay your hands on someone near you that has their hand raised, even if you have your hand raised. You're going to pray for them. They're going to pray for you. Okay, so everyone make sure that you're Someone's got a hand on, on everyone here who has a hand raised. Make sure. And if you do not have someone praying for you, kind of wave your hand a little bit, and someone nearby will lay a hand on you. Lay a hand on these people with their hands raised. Now, here, here you go, Toronto. You are people that know how to soak in the Spirit of God. You've been soaking Him up for years. Go after the powers of darkness and bring back the things that have been stolen. In the name of Jesus Christ, go for it. Pray for it. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Go after it. We call the prodigals home in the name of Jesus. We call to the nations. Prodigals, come home! Shoot! 
Go! Shoo! Keep it up. You're doing fine. Keep it up. Go after it. Healing in the name of Jesus. Miracles. Miracles. We call from heaven the resources of heaven. Come, Lord. Sudarabaka. Sudarakaba. Nidanaboshinama. Shoo. 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 Kababaraba. Shoo. That's right. Go for it. Go for it. That's right. Let the battle cry come out of your hearts. Go! We go after it. Jesus! Ooh. Yes, Lord. Get some stuff back tonight. Prophesy over the enemy. We're going to take your head off. This day. While you have your while you have your hand gently laid upon them, just ask for an impartation of a warrior spirit to come upon that person. Just all around you, just say, Lord, bring your warrior spirit upon them in the name of Jesus. We will not sit back any longer. Whew.
ว้าวว้าว So we see intercessors, Lord. Return the roar of the lion to the church, Lord. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Yes. Ooh, ooh. <clears throat> Now, let's do a little.、Uh, I said I was going to do three things. Let's do two B, two B. Is there anyone here? I want you to. I want you to point to the Canadian flag up here, and I want you to prophesy. You've been to the prophetic conference now for about forty-eight hours. I want you to prophesy over Canada. It doesn't matter what country you're from. This nation is hosted, has hosted an incredible revival that has flowed like a river to the nations of the world. Yet this nation has not been changed culturally as a result of this revival. And I want to see that change. And I want you to prophesy over that flag right now. Right now, just let a roar go forth over Canada. Speak to this nation. Canada, Canada, shoot, shoot, shoot. Salvation, healing rivers flow. Yes. Yes. <clears throat> And its leaves were for the healing of the nations. <clears throat> wow. We mark this day in time. We mark this hour in time, Lord. That a revolution would come to this nation in the spirit, Lord, and by it you might change the nations of the world. In Jesus' name, Jesus' name. Whoa! Hey, that was pretty good. You guys know what you're doing. All right. And this is what we're going to do. In fact, I may need、uh, Lindley. Lindley, maybe you can、uh, come up and help me.、Uh, we're going to. She's going to help me organize this because we want to get the.、Uh, if you, should they be seated for a second or? Yeah, if you could just be seated just for a second, we're going to arrange this prophetic deal. Okay, listen up. This is going to be an awesome time. So, the people under the flags on the fold-up chairs, I'm going to need you to stand up and stack those chairs up against the wall and、uh, stacks of I think it's twenty、uh, behind. I mean, underneath the mezzanine, if you could. Pick up your belongings and take them to a safe place. Stack your chairs also against the wall. If someone could open the divider, that would be great. Now, normally we get you guys to stand on the lines, and then the ministry team come to you. Tonight, we're going to ask for the、um, school and, and the people that are going to be prophesying and the ministry team to stand on the lines. 
and then you go and line up in front of them and in lines like a checkout counter uh, of about 10 to 15 people per person. Okay? So you don't need to move yet until we've got our team set up on the line. So you can just sit there and talk to your neighbour for a minute while we get ourselves organised. And when I say go, I want you to line up, find yourself a person. They're all highly anointed, okay? And uh, are great prophets and prophetesses. So you just find yourself a person and line up in front of them and uh, then what is going to happen is we're going to direct you through it, okay? We're going to be 90 seconds each person. 90 seconds each person. Now, the school have been prophesying most of the day and most of the week, so they're already in the flow, so they won't take any cranking to get going, all right? So you don't need to fear being number one in the line because they're already in the flow of the Holy Spirit. Okay. School, could you stand up a minute? Could you, uh, ones over there, just... um, Come hard up against the chairs until I get the ministry team to stand on the line. So everybody that's looking at me wondering what to do, just come and gather up in this chair area so we have space for our ministry team to stand on the lines. Thanks, Larry. Ministry team, school, listen up. When you stand uh, on the lines, could you stand about one arm length apart just for a little bit of privacy, all right? So you just stand on the lines. Now, I'd like you to stand on the lines down there and also around, I'm sorry, in lines under the mezzanine, uh, just, yeah, on the lines under the mezzanine as well. So if the ministry team that want to prophesy and the school, if they could go to their stations now. All hands on deck. So um, I think that the soaking school, I'd like to just ask you to receive tonight. The soaking school, if you'd like to be in receive mode for this particular section. I'm just asking the ones that we have trained prophetically ourselves at this point. I'm sorry, I naturally assumed that my prophetic team would be uh, prophesying tonight, so I release all my prophetic team to do that. I would really like you to do that. In fact, please do that. Okay, underneath the mezzanine, everybody wave at me. If you are not on the ministry team, then don't stand on the lines. If you could just clear that area and let my ministry team and the school uh, just stand on the lines and then you can line up in front of them. So just give them a bit of space to organise themselves. That would be fabulous. All right. Now, while the uh, prophetic teams are getting in place, the school of ministry... By the way, I've worked with the school of ministry. These are These are dynamic young people. I mean... You're getting really a cream of the crop. They've been soaking in the presence of God. They've been trained. They look. This is a win-win situation. They get a chance to exercise what God's placed within them, and you get a chance to receive from it. So as they get in line, what we do is we want everyone to form, like Lindley said, just like the grocery store, little checkout lines in front of them. As much as you can get, about 10 or 15 in front, lined up right in front of each prophetic person that's standing on the line. So... Uh, Lindley, should we just release a section at a time? Or no. Could, yes. Okay. This left-hand section line up against, if these people here, if um, this section here could fill any gaps that are at the end of these lines but then go to the back and obviously if these people here will go to the back there's tons of people at the back so fill up these ones here first and then if there's no spots left um, 
if the lines are too long, I mean, then go to the back. We're probably looking around 10 to 15 people per prophetic person, okay? Okay, now, School of Ministry and those that are prophesying, just hold up for a minute. I'm going to tell you how we're going to do it because there's a way to do it so that we can make sure we get everyone covered. Otherwise, we'd be here till about 4 in the morning. So just listen closely. I'm going to give you a little bit of time before each person just to wait on God. It's not going to be a lot of time. It's going to be about 30 seconds. And then we're going to start, and you're going to have 90 seconds. When I say begin, I want you to begin speaking over them, whether you have anything or not. Okay, so you begin speaking over them. We'll go 90 seconds. I'll give you a 15-second warning at the end. and You'll stop. You'll dismiss that person. They can either go back to their seat or go back to their hotel. And we'll move on to the next person with 30 seconds waiting and then starting. It's important that everyone follow it close. And we've done this before with hundreds and hundreds of people, and it works very well. 90 seconds is a good quality of time to receive a word from God. So make sure all school ministry are all ready and you follow the directions very close so we make sure that we prophesy over everybody in the room. And it won't take that long if we do it. Okay, can I ask a very important request of everybody at the conference? Can I ask that you only line up once? Because the prophetic people have got a lot of people to prophesy over tonight, and if you hop from line to line, then they won't get to bed till 2 o'clock in the morning. Alright? So please be a person of integrity and only line up in one line and get one word. The other thing is once you actually have received your prophetic word, I'm asking that you return to your seat or you're, and you're all released to go home. The reason being, uh, it's the, the less congestion we have, the, the easier it is on the team, okay? So once you've had your prophetic word, then just return to your seat. Okay, everybody ready? Where's the School of Ministry and Prophetic Teams? Just kind of wave at me so I know you're, okay, you're hearing me okay? Great. All right, you're going to do a great job. Let me pray for you. And those that are in line, kind of just uh, chain link to the front of the line. I mean, put your hand on the shoulder of the person in front of you so we can pray for the prophetic people in the front. So let's just take a minute. We're going to pray for the prophetic people in each of these lines. Lord, I ask right now, Lord, that there would be an open heaven over these individuals that are prophesying. School of ministry, prophecy people. I pray, Lord, for a toning down of manifestations, and we ask for a clear interpretation to come forth out of their mouth, communicating symbols, signs, pictures, scriptures, words of knowledge, whatever you have, Lord. We say, bring it on in the name of Jesus Christ. And we release them right now with the anointing of the Lord in Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Okay, now. Every school of ministry or prophetic team member right now, you should have somebody standing right in front of you. I want you to take 30 seconds just to wait on God. Don't say anything to them. Just wait on God and get what God has for you for that person. At the very least, share a scripture with them, and God will give you a peppering of revelation when you share that scripture. But let's just wait right now. 30 seconds of silence. The music's okay, but 30 seconds of silence. All across the room, give them a chance. They're just going to wait on God. And we'll pick up our pace as we go through this, but this is the first one. So let's give them a moment. They're kind of collecting their spirit before God, waiting on Him. Just waiting, waiting. Oh, God's going to, God's going to release some great words here tonight. There's an atmosphere for it. I mean, He's here. We're believing in faith. We're moving in faith. In the name of Jesus. Okay. Everybody ready? We have 90 seconds on the clock. Your first ones are in front of you. 90 seconds on the clock. Remember, I'll give you a 15-second warning toward the end so you can wind it down. We'll quickly move on to the next person. 90 seconds on the clock. Ready? Begin. Begin. 